Now, Warren has given honor to one of the greats of American history, General Joseph Warren, whose statue is in the city of Warren, and on that statue are the names of those who are buried in Warren County, who fought in the Revolutionary War and in the War of 1812. Let's hear one story that took place at the beginning of the Revolutionary War, and Debbie Hornberg will tell that story. statue of General Joseph Warren standing right where he stood since the monument was erected in 1917 by the TDU chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution. For the first time at age 56, I stopped to read those names. The south side of the monument lists the name of 66 Revolutionary War soldiers and sailors who are buried in Warren County. The opposing side lists 90 names of soldiers who are buried in Warren County from the War of 1812. The interesting thing that th is that one out of three names that appear on the side of the Revolutionary War Monument reappear on the side of the War of 1812. It's not so remarkable really when you stop to consider that the Revolutionary War had ended just 31 years before the War of 1812 began. Those who had died in the Revolutionary War were fresh ghosts, so to speak. Each of the soldiers had a mother. Many of those soldiers had wives and children. Their stories would be reverently told. If my own family is any indication, those stories would have been embellished through the years, the deeds becoming even more heroic and patriotic. The soldiers of the War of 1812 <clears throat> had heard the, the Revolutionary War stories throughout their entire life. Those stories had to be in their mind when, they, when the winds of war began to blow again. To give you a notion of the power of these stories, I will relate to you the story of William General Joseph Warren, but I'm going to relate it to you from the perspective of his mother. While the perspective is my own creation, the facts of the story are true and unchanged. <coughs> Good evening. My name is Mary Stevens Warren. My son, Joseph Warren, was born on June 11, 1741. He was a good, good boy. He was named for his dear father, Joseph, who was a very respectable farmer in his time. He died when Joseph was 14 after a terrible fall while picking apples. Now Joseph was an academic. He graduated from Harvard in 1759, and he became a school teacher at the Roxbury Grammar School. But he was drawn back to college to study medicine. Not so surprising, really. His younger brother, John, actually founded the Harvard School of Medicine later on. My son, Joseph, opened his own practice in 1764. That was a big year for him. It was also the year that he married his beautiful wife, Elizabeth Hooden. She was a lovely girl and from such a prominent family. It was a very good match socially, but they were a devoted couple as well. They had four children, Elizabeth, Joseph, Mary, and Richard. My grandchildren were left motherless when their mother died, but my son was an excellent father to his children. Now, I should have been happy to see my boy live a quiet life as a very skilled physician, but that was not to be. He was a passionate patriot, and the flames of that patriotism were fanned mightily when he joined the Masonic Lodge. He eventually became the Grand Master, of course. This connection led him to rub soldiers with the likes of John Hancock and Samuel Adams, radical leaders of the Sons of Liberty. 
Now my Joseph had a vision to see America released from the tyranny of the British Parliament, and so he joined forces with the Sons of Liberty. Now my son had many gifts. He was brilliant, an excellent physician, a natural leader, but he was also a powerful and galvanizing writer who wrote the Suffolk Resolves, which advocated resistance to the British and were endorsed by the Continental Congress. He also wrote a newspaper article using the pseudonym A True Patriot, and that article was considered so subversive that the British attempted to try the publishers, Mr. Gill and Mr. Edes, who had printed it but no jury would convict them. As the tensions between Britain and America came to head, he was appointed to Boston's Committee of Correspondence. This was no doubt due to his oratory and writing skills. There were 13 colonies and 13 committees, and they coordinated responses to Britain's unjust rules and decrees. 7,000 to 8,000 patriots worked together in all the colonies, and they shared their plans. Espionage enabled them to replace, one at a time, royals and loyalists who held governmental positions with the American patriots. Christopher Sider is the first American to be killed in the British-American tensions. He was part of a mob protesting outside the shop of loyalist sympathizer Theophilus Lilly, and he was shot by a man who fired into the crowd hoping to fire to frighten the crowd away. When Sider died later that night, it was of course my son who was called in with his superior medical talents to perform the autopsy. It was the public outrage over that event, among others, that led to the Boston Massacre 11 days later. And again, it was my son who was called to assemble the report on that event. Do you remember the midnight ride of Paul Revere and the lesser known William Dawes? The British are coming, the British are coming. It was General Joseph Warren who sent them forth on April 18th. He had received word that General Gage from Boston planned to attack and destroy munitions in Concord and Lexington the following day. Now my son, allow me to brag a little, he was tall and extremely handsome. He was very charismatic, although his noble character would have never permitted him to abuse that. Still, it was Margaret Gage, the wife of General Gage, that is reported to have provided this information to my son. My son fought valiantly in the Battle of Lexington and Concord. He took grave, grave risks. I was quite horrified to hear that a musket ball had torn through the very wig on his head. I begged, oh how I begged, I pleaded with my boy not to take such risks with his precious life. I will never forget it. He looked at me and he said, where there is danger, dear mother, there must your son be. Now is no time for any of America's children to shrink from any hazard. My son was a hero. I hope you understand this. He rushed to the battle of Bunker Hill. General Prescott was very aggrieved to see that he had placed himself in such peril. General Prescott knew full well how important my son was to America. He offered my boy the command immediately, but my boy would have none of it. He would fight alongside the men as one of them. That was Joseph's way. And when he went to the redoubt, loud cries of huzzah, huzzah, rang out from the men. They knew what a patriot he was. General Putnam also immediately offered his command to my son, but no, not for Joseph. The fighting was fierce, fiercer than you can imagine. The British attacked three times. The first two times they were repulsed. The muskets rang out again and again, just deafening the smoke, creating a thick haze. Twice the British forces were repulsed. 
my son raced to and fro, crying out to the men. These men say that we won't fight. By heaven, I hope that I shall die in my knees in blood. It breaks my heart to hear those words. That precious boy fought until there was no more ammunition. Even then, he stayed. He used rocks and clubs and fists to give the militia as much time as possible to get away during the third assault. We may have lost that battle, but we made the British pay a heavy price for their win. 226 dead, over 800 wounded. Many of the losses were their officers. My own loss was even greater. My precious son was recognized and shot dead on the battlefield on June 17, 1775, a musket ball to the head. His body lay there all night long because the British General Howe simply could not believe that such a celebrated and high-ranking personage, personage such as my son would have exposed himself to such a hazardous battlefield. The following day, General Howe came to see for himself, and my son's body was bought, identified by an English surgeon who knew him professionally. General Howe remarked that the death of one such adversary was worth 500 men. The British were ruthless. They bayoneted him until the body was unrecognizable, and then they stuffed his noble body into a shallow ditch. British Captain Walter Lowry, who had been defeated at the Old North Bridge, said that he had stuffed the scoundrel with another rebel into one hole and there his, he and his seditious principles may remain. My son was a martyr, and even in death, his courageous um, death continued to encourage the American patriots as the winds of war raged on. Ten months later, my youngest son went with Paul Revere to look for my Joseph, and his body was found. It was such a terrible sight to behold that my son John fainted dead away at the sight of it. The body, body was positively identified by two false teeth, which Mr. Revere had made and wired to the adjoining teeth. His remains were brought home to Boston, where they were buried with the honor due him.